Uh, Matt, let me start uh, with you. How did you come to the work of Jane Jacobs? You're a, you, you grew up in Los Angeles, although you've spent a lot of time in New York as an adult. A Los Angeles native doesn't speak well to uh, sidewalks and eyes in the street. Uh, well, I've lived here for forever and ever, and uh, lived in Soho, and uh, was an architecture nerd, and uh, found the book at a bookstore that I think is now a Marc Jacobs boutique on Bleecker Street, but it used to be a bookstore, and uh, bought it and read it about 10 years ago, and I thought, this is an incredible book. Um, and uh, I mean, the, it makes you see the city in an entirely different way. I think that, uh, at the very least, and I began to see New York in a different way. And then uh, after the Valentino movie was out, uh, looking for another project, and Robert and I uh, were talking about our mutual uh, admiration for Jane Jacobs, realized there hadn't been a documentary about her. So, um, and I think one thing we need more of right now, it seems to me, is more public intellectuals. And she was certainly that. And I think that it's time more people knew about her legacy and her thinking. Uh, Roberta, can you put into context how you knew Jane Jacobs? And I'm interested to know what you see in this film that reflects her and, and maybe other things that we don't get in this film that you'd want to describe about her. Well, I think the first thing um, to point out, and I know Jane would want me to make a note of this for everyone who thinks they have to read her book in order to understand cities. I learned a lot of what Jane wrote about as a reporter at the old New York Post in the 1960s and 70s, and you all know what that means. Um, and I was out on the street, and I was covering neighborhoods, and I was covering fights among uh, you know, uh, groups fighting to save their neighborhood. And I was learning what was making the city work. And um, at some point, uh, I um, uh, signed a contract for my first book with Jason Epstein, who's in the film. And uh, he was Jane's editor. And he says, well, now you have to go to Toronto and meet Jane Jacobs. Can you talk about your direct experience and, and how you think some of the ideas from this film can be carried forward into uh, a contemporary conversation? Yeah. Um, oh, I think it's something Roberta taught me that that it's not. This is not meant to be. Jane wouldn't have want her book to be taken as prescriptions or answers for our problems today. What she would say, I think, is for us to look around our city and come up with our own what is working and what is not working. And I think that's the job in some ways for the Highline now is. As, as the movie closed, is she was a skeptic. I mean, she was also an optimist, but a skeptic in a great way. And I think we have to look at what are, what's working about the Highline, but what is not working? What, what is our responsibility in that? What is our role in some of the things that have happened in the neighborhood? And then what, what can we do to, to make it better? Uh, Darren, uh, I, speaking of public intellectuals, I think Dwight McDonald once described uh, the Ford Foundation is a giant pile of money surrounded by people who want some. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and with all the decisions you have to make over uh, what to do, how to smartly invest uh, uh, the, the capital of the Ford Foundation, you can talk about criminal justice, you can talk about health issues. What is it about cities that, and, uh, and this project that st stands out to you? Well, if you care about democracy and people, cities are where this plays out. And I think what's interesting about the trajectory of our understanding of cities, first through the lens of, of Jane's brilliance, over time is the intersection of planning and development, social policy, and cultural practice. Because the thing that is not mentioned in the film in an explicit way is the intersection of race with all of these issues. And so over time, we, we come to understand what was in some ways initially planned as and conceptualized agnostic of race. The intersection of race and racism and housing policy have produced and in some ways compounded 
what was the original deficiencies. And so the Pruitt Ego housing that we saw was, was bad planning. It, the, the negative externalities were compounded by the racist decision to isolate the community and then further compounded by a housing policy that said that only people with incomes at 150% of poverty and below could live there. So this was doomed from the beginning if ultimately it was to actually make people live in habitable, vibrant communities. That, that simply was not possible. Jane also, from a filmmaking perspective, presented us with a huge challenge in that she didn't do a lot of television, actually. Uh, the book came out in 61 when there wasn't a lot of television compared to what we have now. Book chat on TV is always limited, so we had a limited universe of things. We did find the color interview of her from the 70s has never been seen before. Only a couple minutes of it were in a movie uh, in the late 70s. So this is material that no one's seen, which is really exciting. But how to bring Jane's voice into the film, and uh, we made the decision to have an actress read it, and Marissa Tomei has had a, a long interest in Jane, it turned out, and her father uh, turns out to have been a colleague of Jane's in the, the um, battles of the downtown Manhattan in the 60s. So she was wonderful. I think she grasped it beautifully and presents it, and uh, we're very grateful that she had the interest and was did such a lovely job. So, uh, Robert and Darren, as you have dialogues with people around the world who are looking sol to solutions for their cities. What are some of the points of light that you're seeing? I mean, you know, I, last night I heard Darren and Roberta in conversation, and I, this is a slightly different, I'd love, but Dar <laughs> it was very uplifting. I came into it in a very uh, sort of sad mood. And Darren, I'd love for you to just share, because it was so hopeful, about about hope of what people need in in terms of that why people make decisions when they don't have hope. Okay. <laughs> Do you mind? <laughs> um, well, we were last night. Yeah. But we were talking about how important it was local, and that this is where the the future since November eighth is really going to happen because that's where hope is going to be is making change on the local level and right i mean the context was the context was our our analysis and our um, anguish um, that many people experienced this week and i was just simply observing that that part of the challenge today and we see it manifest in cities but we also see it manifest in in rural areas in a in a time of growing inequality in the country that that the greatest threat to our nation is not ISIS or a pandemic, it's hopelessness. Because hopelessness drives people to do irrational things. And I think often those of us who see things rationally because we are privileged, when we see other people do things that absolutely make no sense, we're confounded by it. And we're confounded by it because we don't understand the sense of desperation and hopelessness. And I think in the United States today, we privileged people who live in places like New York and Los Angeles don't understand the depth of hopelessness that exists in our nation. And, and if we did, we wouldn't be surprised by what happened this week. And that's what we were talking about. And we were talking about how cities can be places of hope and how what Jane talked about was really in many ways the way you build and preserve hope in a community at the street level. That's what she was all about. 
Uh, one of the things that I find... Yeah. Wasn't that helpful? <laughs> Good for you. I wanted to hear it again, so that now I can start saying it. Um, we, we uh, at the Highline, a lot of people use us as a, a model, and I guess it makes us a little nervous, because I think one of the interesting things is the things we've done right, but also the things we've done wrong. And we convened a group of uh, about 30 people from 15 projects all over uh, the U.S. working on these industrial reuse projects, these kind of hybrid projects. And what was, we thought all they would want to talk about is how do you raise the money, how do you get it built? But the number one issue was this issue of equity. And both, equity in both sense, one, partly money, but more importantly, that the social issues, that these things can't just be economic successes, they have to benefit everyone. And it's a really, it's a challenge because cities want to do these things because they create economic development, which has to be part of it. But how do you balance that with the social problems that they can cause? And what, what, it, what is the role of, and it, what was interesting is seeing these people that are building public spaces, realizing they have to look at issues of housing, health, education, displacement, um, you know, before they're built, as they're built. And once they're built, it's not just leaving, but, but addressing those issues that, that come up. So, I mean, I find that really helpful. We didn't think, of, that's not what we were thinking about. We were more in the old school of trying to save cities. Now cities in some ways have been saved, and it's a matter of dealing with these issues of over-success. So, can ahead. I add Pardon. something to that? Because I think, um, and I've had this conversation with Robert to some extent. In many ways, the high line is a metaphor for a lot of what Jane wrote about. Um, for those of you who don't know, and many of you do, it started exactly the way she said local things should start. Two guys sitting at a community board meeting, hearing that this thing is gonna be torn down and look at each other and say, that's nuts. And the rest is history. It was local, it was reaction, it was knowing what was there and coming together to find a solution. What continues the metaphor is they are now wrestling with success. This city is wrestling with the success of a lot of its neighborhoods. And the reality is there are solutions. There have been solutions in many places, but the solutions are gonna come if the process that she talked about, which involves the very people who are being affected, along with the people who, from the top, who can make, help make things happen. If those things mesh, then you have a real path. And so the trajectory of, of the High Line starts at that very fundamental Jacob's place and is now wrestling with a success, which she would, I'm sure, say, leave it to them to decide, leave it to the people. People shouldn't come in and make a decision. I remember she was alive uh, after, well, uh, when Hurricane Katrina occurred and w I was in Toronto not long afterwards and someone said to her, Jane, what are we gonna do for the people of New Orleans? She said, you are going to do nothing. She could be very abrupt. You are going to do nothing for the people of New Orleans, they are going to do it for themselves. And that was fundamental, and here it is. I want to thank uh, everyone, uh, Darren, Robert, Roberta, Matt, for joining us and uh, sharing your insights. Thank you.